Good afternoon, everyone. Um, great pleasure that I get to introduce Dr. Chris Powers today. He's been here at USC since 1997, and he's a full professor, and he is one of the co-directors of the Musculoskeletal Biomechanics Research Lab. He has had lots of major research accomplishments to include over 200 peer-reviewed publications in clinical trials, musculoskeletal, and clinical biomechanics. He also has received four different research awards, two from the APTA for sustained contributions to literature to include the Merriam Williams Award and the Helen Hislop Award. He also has had two publication awards as well, the Dorothy Briggs Scientific Inquiry Award and the Rose Award for Excellence in Research by the Academy for Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Dr. Powers. Thanks, Lori. So I have to admit um, this, this Five minute talk took me five days, so I want to thank the rack for that that punishment. Um, so I, I decided um, that I would kind of give a past, present, and future overview of kind of my my thirty year journey. I, I I started here at USC actually in ninety one as a PhD student, so it is been over thirty years in terms of my my journey in terms of uh, research here. So the start off, you know, my my research program, um, my overall theme is, is really to identify and understand mechanisms of lower extremity injury uh, with the idea that, you know, by understanding what how these injuries occur, we can develop more effective and efficient clinical interventions. Um, the the clinical problem that I have attempted to solve in my career is patellofemoral pain, anterior knee pain, um, which is the most common lower extremity overuse injury in active individuals. So I, my, I've, my doctoral dissertation was in this area and I've continued along this, this line um, for a couple of decades now. Um, you know, our, our group has taken a, a really multifaceted approach to understand mechanisms of patellofemoral pain. I'm going to kind of walk you through this uh, a little bit. A lot of my early work um, actually involved um, in vitro studies. Uh, this is kind of work that um, I started as part of my postdoc, um, looking at more of the kind of the intrinsic mechanics of the patellofemoral joint in the knee and and these studies are really were, were helpful in understanding uh, basically how, how, how the, the joint deals with loads and the various tissues around the joint as well. Um, and this obviously has moved on to more of the traditional biomechanical studies, looking at movement behavior um, in, in patients with knee pain. And, you know, over the years, we probably have studied pretty much every type of movement you could think of um, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what active people typically engage in. Um, uh, we have also done a lot in terms of imaging. Uh, the imaging studies we've done have been very helpful in understanding more uh, patient-specific morphology and alignment issues and, and even kinematics using high-speed imaging to capture uh, patellar tracking uh, in real time. So uh, we, we clearly have learned that um, in terms of anterior knee pain, it's really a combination of biomechanical risk factors as well as anatomical and structural risk factors. And we've been able to put these two areas together using modeling approaches. Uh, and we've uh, over the years developed a very patient-specific modeling approach where we can Create, recreate, um, you know, 3D geometry of individuals' joints and apply forces uh, to these models based on biomechanical data that we collect in the lab, and and really with the goal to understand um, the interaction between the biomechanics and the structural morphology and how that contributes to abnormal loading um, at the joint and as well as the articular cartilage. So. Um, um, so that is kind of how these, these pieces come together. Um, you know, I, I kind of learned early in my career um, that really knee pain is, is really not just a knee problem. Um, it is really the result of uh, the interaction of the entire lower quarter. Um, 
you know, the hip, the foot and ankle, et cetera. So, you know, really when I was in, you know, early on in my career, you know, knee pain was a knee problem, but um, our, our work is, is really opened up the fact that this is really a, a lower chain problem. And in particular, um, you know, at some point in my career, I decided to open up an anatomy book and, and was happy to find or that, you know, the femur is actually half the knee joint. And, um, you know, you could see that the femur is actually controlled at the hip, shockingly. Um, and, and that's really where we started to look more proximally at the prime movers, the stabilizers of the femur, which turn out to be key stabilizers of the knee. And, you know, I've, I've kind of taken this, this theme, not just to patellofemoral pain, um, but, you know, we have expanded looking at hip control and hip stability to other clinical conditions. Um, we know that it's a factor related to ACL injury. Um, turns out it's related to ankle sprains, um, even low back pain. And more recently, um, work from Jenny Bagwell and, and Jordan Cannon, uh, the contribution of the hip related to femoral acetabular impingement. So, so really, our, our work has really ex expanded beyond just knee pain and it really looked at the contribution of uh, hip muscle stability and control to other musculoskeletal conditions. Um, this obviously has opened up the door for us to really start to explore clinical interventions related to um, hip strength. Um, we have published a couple randomized trials related to hip strengthening and, and knee pain. Um, but we have also have looked at this in patients with low back pain and also how use of the hip can actually help people with hip pain pathology. So um, uh, this mechanistic work that really took, you know, 10, 15 years to develop is, is really uh, morphed into an area of more, more clinical application. So that's kind of where we've been. Um, where am I today? And, you know, I want to give a shout out to Beth. Uh, you know, when Beth and I started our movement analysis course together, you know, we, we, that, that really fostered a lot of great discussion about, you know, um, motor control and, and movements and, and how these, uh, the neural aspects of the biomechanical aspects come together um, related to injury. And, you know, Beth and I have collaborated quite a bit over the last, uh, you know, five to 10 years, really looking at this relationship between uh, brain and, and behavior. Um, you know, we have, you know, a big interest in hip control and hip muscles. Um, we've been able to develop uh, methods to look at um, assessing corticomotor changes in gluteus maximus with TMS. Um, there's Yoshi, one of my former PhD students there. Um, some of her more recent work has shown um, that gluteus maximus corticomotor excitability is related to hip extensor strength. Um, and you can see the differences here between males and females. Um, so, you know, clearly, you know, in terms of our, our, our looking at, at hip interventions, there's clearly a, uh, a central nervous system issue at play here. Um, you know, we are also interested in looking at corticomotor excitability related to specific movement behaviors um, that are not good for the knee. Um, so this is, uh, uh, Yo also looked at this as part of her dissertation and I'm hoping that uh, Max Monk is gonna continue this line of research um, in his dissertation. So, um, you know, we're also been focusing a lot on the clinical application of this work and, and really trying to figure out optimal ways to increase corticomotor excitability in patients with knee pain uh, with the idea that this is a prerequisite to them being able to use these muscles appropriately during more uh, high demand activities. So um, we've been definitely looking at how this activation protocol that we've developed uh, translates over to more functional strengthening exercises um, that would be used clinically. So where am I going? I, I have two um, 
major questions that I would like to address moving forward and, you know, kind of related to the work that we do at MPI, you know, I, I'm really interested in understanding what are the optimal methods to change complex movement behaviors, uh, particularly in active individuals. Uh, we do this all the time clinically, um, but we really don't fully understand the optimal methods to achieve the, the desired results. And probably more importantly is, you know, understanding how our interventions carry over into the real world environment. Um, and with the advent of more uh, real-time motion tracking, um, markerless tracking, um, eventually we're gonna be able to look at these kinematics uh, in real world situations, soccer fields, football fields, et cetera. So trying to understand how our clinical interventions um, actually carry over to protect against future knee injury. And I was hoping this video would play a little bit more because it's pretty cool, but we can see the tracking of the real-time player movements. So with that being said, I will end here. I just pulled up this picture. Uh, I believe it was taken in 2012, uh, kind of what I consider the heyday of MBRL. You can see, you probably recognize a lot of people in this, this photo. A lot of our former PhD students, you see Kate Havens there, Joe Armour Smith, Jenny Bagwell, Mark Lyle, Kristen Stearns, uh, Kate Ho, uh, Ping Lee, and Sachi and Rami. So anyways, um, I want to also shout out to George and Cornelia, who have been um, partners in this quest um, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years.